Today, live from the London Podcast Studio, I have two media experts here with me to cover some more stories shaking up the industry. First up, it's Newsweek's executive editor, Alex Hudson. Alex, what's been keeping you busy? Oh, uh, we just relaunched the website. A small uh, thing. A small thing, you know, with all of the overlords that we we uh, obey. Did Facebook, you, did you just knock it up in Dreamweaver on your own in the, in the office? Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> 20 minutes. Just to, um, So we relaunched the homepage last week. All time is a blur. I don't know how long ago that was. Uh, and all of the article pages are just being reworked as we speak. You know, light, fluffy. Nice. The amount of code I've looked through <laughs> is too much. And do, does the nav bar appear at the right place and all of those, <laughs> all of those things? Two weeks before it launched, <laughs> it was manic, and now everything works surprisingly well. Good. Well, uh, you can go and have a look at that at newsweek.com. Correct. Also with us is Jane Osler, EVP of Global Thought Leadership at Data Analytics Company, Kantar. Hi, Jane. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. And what have you been working on recently? Well, we had a big launch this week of the Kantar Creative Effectiveness Awards, which is all the highest scoring ads around the world. Everything that we measured last year, we ranked them all digital, social, TV, print, outdoor, and we gave everybody awards this week. Nice. So, Everyone loves getting a bit of Perspex. Yeah, the clients love it, although these are not Perspex awards nowadays. They're mm. sort of seals that you can put on LinkedIn and things oh, like that. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dig- digital awards. Yeah, of uh, And what, what is the best performing thing? What did well? The best performing social ad or digital ad was an ad by Cadbury's actually Mm -hmm. where a lady's working in a petrol station gives her dad uh, uh, her dad buys her a bar of chocolate and there's a bit of a reveal it's a soft sort of Mm. uh, humor but the the dad is being very generous with chocolate and the best performing tv ad was a brilliant ad by KFC in France where a server at KFC goes back through the ages and goes through the kind of nostalgic what KFC used to be and then suddenly leaps back into the modern day. So he's gone into the kind of multiverse, come back again. So lots of current themes that you see in the cinema and things like that. It's, oh, fun. Yeah, good. I need to, need to check those out. Yeah. Uh, and just before we, we've started recording, we've just seen uh, some news from BuzzFeed in the US. This is from Chief Executive Jonah Peretti saying that they're shutting down BuzzFeed News. And uh, that's as part of a, an effort to cut 15% of its workforce. Alex, what's your insta take on this? When you first told me it was a swear word, Mm. uh, (laughs) because that it seems both inevitable and a surprise. Like BuzzFeed News was doing this incredible work that actually got to the heart of what American journalism and and global journalism should be doing around unearthing truths and holding power to account, all of these things which are really difficult to make a profit from. And therein lies BuzzFeed's model is to get back to growth, get back to revenue growth, get back to understanding how an ad model can work. Because BuzzFeed, probably one of the more difficult out of the American media brands and global media brands to be able to charge a subscription for. So they've tried all sorts of things around shopping and around affiliates and all of these different marketing revenues. But when it comes to hard news, it is more difficult to put advertising around the more difficult topics than it is to put around the lighter stuff or you know the the listicles that they are perhaps better known by most of our, most of the audience for. And Jane, it's, it's difficult because BuzzFeed did so well from the algorithms of Facebook and, and other social platforms. Uh, tweaks to those can suddenly destroy a business, can't they? It, exactly, and I think everybody uh, knows that the changes to the algorithms have resulted in different kinds of content being presented to you on on social feeds. And, you know, whereas maybe, you know, BuzzFeed content may have appeared prevalent sort of three, four, five years ago, it just isn't now. Mm. And these things, you know, the advertising models do rely on reach. Ultimately, you've got to get the big numbers in. So the dependency between all the platforms is is really interesting. I guess, in a way, you know, you could depict this as another in the series of tech related layoffs i noticed there was a a comment in in one of the pieces about buzzfeed saying that they had overhired so if these things are naturally presented as a correction uh, mm. whether they are or not i mean alex it must be something you guys obviously think about at newsweek where where traffic comes from and kind of keeping people on site and the primacy of, of the website again so we could get into the weeds of this you know third party cookie data is slowly quickly dying it's been dying for we, you know we've talked about on this <laughs> in this not this very studio but many other studios about it before you know third party cookies meant to be dying it's, it's not quite there yet and the simple solution is what will make people come to your website directly 
and now we get you know, the Web3 future of decentralized internet and how those big social companies are going to struggle for volume. So it's a very long, very pretentious way of saying the idea of this mass market internet is dying and we're going to go back to at least an extent where you buy a newspaper. It, it will be digital, so it'll be which ones do you align with, which ones do you support, which ones do you believe in, which ones provide the content that you you think you need, want, whatever. And so Newsweek's role in that is we've we've pinned our sort of flag to the mass of fairness and of disagreements and trying to find that thing and we're not scared to tell the difficult stories we will show both sides of them and that's where we think we stand out in the market well uh, telling the truth is another big topic of the week particularly uh, in america as one of the most closely followed media trials of the decade came to an abrupt end before it started on tuesday when fox news agreed to pay 787.5 million us dollars to dominion that's the voting uh, machine company for falsely claiming that dominion had rigged the 2020 us election against donald Trump. Jane, I mean, are we surprised that uh, Rupert Murdoch decided not to appear in the dock and just got his checkbook out instead? Well, it's the it's the easy way out, isn't it? Not to have a big fight and to make the story even more public than it already was and have all the dirty laundry being aired. I guess, you know, interesting to note that Dominion were actually uh, requesting 1.6 billion. So they got just under half of what they had asked. I'm not surprised it was settled um, before it went to court. That seems to be a very sensible approach. But it does raise a lot of issues about how news brands and media brands need to be super extra careful about what they say. You know, they can trash reputations, they can build them within seconds. And it does raise a question about like what scrutiny is put on the copy that is being produced or that you know the words that are being spoken about on a TV screen. It's a risky business. Alex, the libel rules in, in the US, it's a pretty high bar you've got to get above uh, for it to, to cause you trouble. Uh, and you know, the word malice comes up a Ooh, lot. The and First Amendment is vital. <laughs> pretty much everyone was saying, well, you, they hit the malice uh, line um, and they had a, a pretty good chance of losing. Defamation in the US... Firstly, it's incredibly complicated. It's not federal, it's state by state. And how and that is, I am still learning every day coming from a UK background and now working in a US publisher. It is mind-blowing. But what we've seen recently is that defamation is changing slightly, or at least how the American legal system is seeing defamation. And I think um, the Depp Heard thing is, mm. is, is perhaps the clearest example of that. So when that came up, Few people I spoke to thought that would be a success. Success is the wrong word, but it, it would be a thing that ended up with damages needing to be paid because the First Amendment is sacrosanct in the US. And, and with Depp Heard, in effect, in the UK, uh, it was it went one way, and in the US, it went the other way. And, and the, yeah, so the second that the UK rules that there isn't the damages and they didn't award it, you think America is so much more freedom of speech than the UK is, and without meaning to sound that the UK mm. doesn't agree with freedom of speech. And so with this with this case, it questions on Fox previously, there is a real freedom to share your opinion, however controversial or polarizing or factually questionable across all of the major US networks it might be, because it is a fair and honest opinion. Mm. How do you prove malice? It would kind of be difficult. And here it's more just how much is it worth for this just to go away? And the the view is that it is worth more than the $787.5 million for it to go away. I mean, when we look at the, the result, I mean, obviously Dom- Dominion have, have got that cash. What we haven't seen is an on-air apology by Fox News. There was sort of a written, marginal, written, it, written it's, apology. It's not, it, that's not a sort of. That's, that is as close as you're going to get to a full admission that it was not true. And, well, as, as close as you're going to get in legal filings, I think the things that we saw pre-trial perhaps show, showed a more honest approach of what they really thought about what was going on. There was also, a, a, in the statement, it said it, they were delighted that it had been settled amicably. And you, <laughs> you know that that's code for, like, it wasn't. Uh, and, and also, it's quite a lot to get to amicability. Yes. Yeah, it's a high but bar. It's not even the biggest suit that Murdoch has filed like he, his his second wife the, that claim went above what was that that was uh 1.7 billion dollars second wife in 19 so it's it it seems like a, such a ridiculous amount of money and it is such a ridiculous amount of money but it it's all relative well it's about 5 months worth of of fox court profits 
Uh, and there was reporting today that they'll get 200 million back as basically a tax wheeze. Uh, <laughs> so whether so, if you're a, a US taxpayer, you'll be funding the lies that, that, that came out of Fox News. And obviously what was amazing about this story was the evidence they had that internally uh, they knew it was rubbish, but the audience were, or the Fox News was scared of its audience. I mean, some of it you could read actually they're a very audience-focused company, uh, and a lot of media companies maybe don't have the same focus. Clearly, they went a little a little too far uh, on that, but it was amazing reading some of that material, wasn't it? That question, not one that I'm going to answer here, uh, about whether the sort of televised news is, is news or entertainment or culture or mm. a combination of all of the of the above. As as we you know, we've just talked about with BuzzFeed News, news is hard, but to do properly and to do like we've just spent three months in an investigation about submarines it's a brilliant investigation but that's one story for three months work and people are reading it people are enjoying it but it's not a profitable thing what fox is by far the biggest news network in the u.s so it's doing something right and it still has to pay it it, it makes profit through advertising so it has to think audience first and it's just whether or not it has a duty for truth or a duty to for entertainment. And often those things needn't clash with each other. And when they do, it's which takes precedence. I, <laughs> once again, I'm not going to try and answer that one. Uh, Jane, is there anything media companies can learn from this? Or actually was Fox just an outlier in their, their attitude to, to the truth? I think you'd hope they were an outlier because you'd hope that, you know, organisations generally, media organisations would have integrity and oversight about what content they're producing um i think one of the things i thought was interesting was obviously as part of the case you know all thousands and thousands of emails thousands of texts were sort of combed through so it just shows like on an everyday basis how careful you have to be whether you're expressing an opinion or you know or a fact you know it it's good you know if it comes to court it's going to be dragged out into the open air I do think it's it's about internal scrutiny and how journalists and others are held accountable but you know there's always going to be outliers and as you say it's it's that fine line between what's news and entertainment which means that perhaps a little more liberty is taken by some and it's that liberty so it's in America is the outlier so 80 percent of countries still have defamation as a criminal prosecution and this slaps which I keep forgetting the the long number strategic lawsuits against public participation and all of these things are meant to meant to stifle so you can slap that's the way mm. it comes from a defamation suit on on things that criticize the government that you don't mm. want that the those officials don't want to see heard and then there is a prevention of publication or repercussions that could end up in prison and so that that's why the defamation law exists in the way it does and that's why it's really vital that we don't see this individual case as, as serious as it is as, as a wider thing and we need to focus on what's the damage that slaps is doing across the world uh, also in the news, uh, streaming subscriptions. It's a topic that we, we've talked about a lot on the show. And the first quarter figures for streaming subscriptions have been released this week. Yep. <coughs> By none other than Kantar from, Indeed. from your colleagues. Indeed. Uh, you reported total cancellations of 167,000 paid for streaming subs. Where did you get it all from? We run a service at Kantar called Entertainment On Demand, which is run across a number of different countries. And we survey a large number of people who have streaming subscriptions and we ask them questions about what SVOD organisations they subscribe to, what they watch, whether they've churned, their intention to churn, a whole load of detailed questions. And from that, we extrapolate that to the population's as a whole and so we can come up with these these kind of big numbers but we drill down a bit more than that so we can talk about you know what drives platform uptake and what drives net losses for different platforms so we also discovered for example in in this quarter that you know ITV X premium and mm -hmm. Apple TV plus have actually had fairly good growth as you say, there's been a net loss of nearly 200,000 subscribers. And, you know, but we also talk about the programmes. So we know The Last of Us was the number one stream programme. Clarkson's Farm, I don't know if you've ever yes. watched that on Prime Video, was number two. But also, like, really interesting insights, like what's driving Prime Video, which is doing very well at the moment. And it's sports on Prime Video. Mm. So they've been acquiring lots of sort of sports rights, has driven one in three new subscriptions there. 
you know, and Netflix, their satisfaction has fallen. So that's one of the issues there. But there's also kind of cost of living crisis yes. generally, which is looking, making people look at... Well, Netflix was, I think, yeah. hit the hardest, at the largest loss yeah. of absolute numbers. But I guess it's sort of the biggest. So would you expect that? Or is, are, are they in a little bit of trouble? I think it's they they are the biggest yes but that also means they've got the biggest challenge in terms of retaining existing customers with with new content that continues to appeal to them. They've also got some other things going on behind the scenes so they've sold off their DVD sort of mm. post business they've stopped that. And also they're making, as you know, incursions into the ad supported business, which I haven't seen any numbers reported on that for a while. It's clear it's not going to take over the world. You know, it's only going to be a, a part of how their business is supported. But, you know, and then there's the password sharing, which yes. is kind of about to about to hit as well. So there's a lot of tweaks going on to Netflix, which I think are starting to affect perhaps how they're perceived. But ultimately, it's, it's content that drives subscription. So it's content that's got to keep them going. Alex, are you a Netflix subscriber? I am. What, what else have you got uh, uh, on your on your subs list? Oh, uh, that's a long list. Um, I may or may not borrow a person. <laughs> uh, no, so I subscribe to Prime, which is not for the content at all. That is purely for the ease of delivery. Mm. Yeah. But it's. I think we are sat in this room as a sort of the sort of relative minority where we have what? multiple subscriptions yes. on the go. What, what, what was the numbers? It was fifty-seven percent of households that have a have one subscription. Mm. So that means that there's 40% of households don't have a paid subscription. Yeah. yeah. Which is, you know, and given that, what is it, that 9% of families don't have a laptop or privilege, like, and particularly in our media bubble, we're like, of course, of course this new series exists and this this mm. new BBC thing that we've come out with and this new Netflix thing, this Amazon thing, this Disney thing, mm. and we'll find a way of watching them all. And I think it's how people are making those tough choices that this report feels like it's touching on of, I think for a lot of people... Netflix will be one of the last luxuries that to go. Mm. And so if that's that's going, what are the wider implications mm. of that? And it's not to do with media, it's not to do with entertainment, it's to do with cost of living, like well, you say. Well, we talked yeah. about, a, a little bit about this last week. I mean, the cost of living crisis, sometimes you will keep a 1099 or 1299 subscription because it's quite good value. Yeah, Faraz yeah. chose the brave, brave phrasing of the lipstick thing, didn't he? They, they yes, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, I think we all make choices is is the reality. And actually, you know, 599, 699 a month is, a, is probably a, a small price to pay for entertainment. But the trade-off is maybe you don't go to the movies mm. in the cinema or maybe you don't go out for expensive meals anymore we've seen a lot of this in our other research which is it's big ticket items that people are making the tough choices on but you know there's there's also you know smaller choices that people make every day with food and subscriptions and it might be that there's a bit of trimming going on i think yes mm. it, it does make you look at your bank statement a little bit doesn't it to go oh, do i use all these do i use all these things yeah. saying that my mother got in touch with me this week and was saying she's bought a new freeview hard drive recorder because she loves recording stuff off the telly even though she could watch it uh, on streaming right so she has her own mum flicks uh, which she is <laughs> curating herself i mean also netflix was having some trouble this week with uh it's foray into live wasn't it alex do you see what happened i didn't see it live because i'm not a big <laughs> love is blind super <laughs> fan but it was delayed so this i'm going to quote the ceo greg davis he was sort of a bug that they introduced when they implemented some changes to try and improve live streaming performance which sounds like a press release that <laughs> says nothing yes. um, <laughs> you don't want to be writing that one do you no, that would be an awful one to um write. but if you're getting sort of u.s senators involved in the backlash so alexander case Cortez was saying like where is this thing what's going on here <laughs> and if, if you so maybe you know all all, all marketing is good all all pub, uh, what publicity it? is good publicity. that one um it got a lot of publicity but if you're going to if Netflix are trying to do this live thing it, is it gonna succeed is it gonna if it if it does this they've got maybe one more two more goes before people start going actually the Netflix is ha it never was never will be Jane, for a live. live is hard isn't it Yes, absolutely. But I guess the thing that people perhaps underestimate is that broadcast television is well set up to be live <laughs> because you have transmitters that go from one to many and it's just one signal going out mm. and it's very, very efficient. Whereas, you know, streaming broadcasting is a different 
animal and you know maybe if it's too popular then you know all hell breaks loose so i actually think that you know we should we should defend broadcasting here as well because that's that's what it's really good at and broadcast production teams are used to making these Mm. things happen very very efficiently they are indeed and we'll be back with more from alex and jane after this week's deep dive In this week's Deep Dive, we're going even deeper on the future of the TV streaming landscape with Shalini Govil-Pai, Google's General Manager and Vice President of TV Platforms. Shalini, walk me through the latest from Google TV. So we just announced 800 channels on what we call free ad-supported TV. So it's an industry buzzword um, that's gaining a lot of traction. This is fast. It's fast. fast. It's very, very fast. It's not slow. (laughs) It's fast. And, you know, it really came from the insight Two insights, which again, like you think about and say, oh, isn't that obvious? One is what we call subscription fatigue. People like, oh, I'm paying for Netflix, I'm paying for Amazon, I'm paying for HBO Max, and at some point it's got to stop. I just want like basic TV, and can you just provide it free as well? Like I love my subscriptions, but I also want free. And so that was the number one insight, like free ad supported, people actually love watching that. Two was the insight that Again, lo and behold, yes, there's on demand and you know there are things that are being recommended to you directly, but people love the guide. They still love the EPG and it's because it narrows down your options for what do you want to watch just now. And there's something really magical about being able to watch a channel because it's on live right now and a bunch of other people are watching it as well. And so th- those were the two insights that drove us to launch our first free ad supported TV in a live guide. And that's what we just announced. So it's interesting from a publisher perspective, different people are doing sort of different things. So sometimes these are channels that are all about one topic. So watching like Hell's Kitchen TV and just seeing Gordon Ramsay shout at people nonstop. Some people like NBC and the sort of the News Now type stuff is maybe more akin to a, a traditional linear channel. Everyone's looking at it in a slightly different way, aren't they? It depends on, of course, a lot of the personalities in the home. And some people like to watch only certain types of content. But in general, what we find is people actually like flipping. And so, yes, there's a moment for Hell's Kitchen. And then there's a moment for the local news that people want to tune into. And then there's a moment for the local sports that a lot of people want to tune into. And so our goal is to support all the channels in a way that ideally we're able to allow our users to tune in very quickly to what it is that they're in the mood for at that particular time. Uh, And you say 800 channels. Obviously, that is quite a lot to to scroll through. That's a lot of pressing down uh, (laughs) if if you're not not, uh, sort of browsing by by section. You guys are obviously in the search business, so you know how to uh, to find content. How how are customers going to tackle all this this material, which I'm sure will only grow? Yes, so the way that we've launched it, Matt, is that you don't have to scroll through the EPG completely. We have on the left-hand side of our navigation, we have very, very easy to find categories. So it could be world content, which we are very proud of launching. It could be sports, could be news, and so you can categorize. And of course, like you said, you know, for Google, the secret sauce and magic is always how, how do we help people get faster to what they wanna watch. And so we do have recommendations that are tailored to the household as well as to the time of day. So, you know, depending on when you are, there are different things that would appeal to you. And obviously this is a service that's initially launched in the in the US. Are we expecting to see it go to other territories, including here in the UK? Yes, it uh, is coming soon. But that's the, that, that's the goal. I mean, our goal is always global. So we launch in different countries, depending on profiles and our partner relationships. But then the goal is always to go global. And we're back with part two. Uh, Alex and Jane are still with me. And we're going to take a quick detour into the latest in podcasting. This week, production house Gimlet announced it will be expanding distribution of some of its podcasts beyond Spotify. Uh, The studio behind hits like Reply All and Heavyweight has been under Spotify's exclusivity model uh, for a little while now. Um, It's because Spotify acquired Gimlet. And obviously one of the benefits was they could drag people over to their platform. Alex, why, why are they changing their mind? because you need new audiences and if you are only in this closed garden you know we were talking earlier web three blah blah like closed mm. garden stuff but if unless you can find a way to make things go viral and travel into audiences who wouldn't otherwise experience them or otherwise find them it means you're just preaching to the converted 
and Spotify's model relies on quick growth and vast growth, and then you need to retain them. Spotify's model has been really good at retaining audiences because suddenly all of your playlists, all of your favorite podcasts go, but Spotify relies on growing this thing, and that's why they're changing. Because particularly in long form, you're not going to find a 10-second clip that's going to fly from a podcast unless you're as big as Joe Rogan, unless you're already that size. For these mid-sized things, you have to seed the entire thing into communities. And if you're looking at the way that Patreon is doing a lot of podcasting, or the podcasters that are succeeding on Patreon, it's here is one podcast a week for X and if you if you want to become part of the club, the exclusive club, you get extra bonuses. You can have a pint with us whenever you want. That'll be ten pounds, fifteen pounds, twenty pounds a month. You know the, the tiered subscriptions thing. But without the foot in the door to get in there in the first place and to know about it, they have to go to where people already are. It's the same way as publishers in the early noughties. When the social revolution happened, publishers thought they could just publish on their sites and people would come. And then oh wait, no, you need to post to Facebook so people will come. And that's what they are. There will be a balance. I think they will revert back relatively quickly to an extent, but the growing pains. Patreon.com slash media pods if you do want to support the show. <laughs> uh, Jane, I mean, Walled Gardens is interesting. Obviously, telly is very much Walled Garden. Mm. Is it operating in a different space than the audio providers? I think if you look at audio, which is still obviously is a small proportion mm. of, of, you know, hours consumed, but also in terms of ad revenues as well, the main thing that people need to drive is reach, especially when you've got new concepts and new types of programs. You've got to build reach very quickly. Um, and that works for audiences, but it also is important for advertisers as well. And I think we know from our research that, you know, marketers are planning to increase their investment in podcast advertising this year that's you know that was the same last year as well so the intention is there but what they don't want to do is necessarily be looking at lots and lots of very small targeted podcasts they do need some big sort of tentpole events in there Mm. as well that they can they can market with so I think it's really important to you know, as Alex says, drive new audiences. And the only way you can do that is by busting out of the wall garden. You know, either that or the wall garden has to be so massive in the first place mm. that there's still headroom within that. But once you get to that, you have to you have to have a different strategy. So it, it's an interesting one because it, it sounded when Spotify acquired Gimlet that it was it would be a virtuous circle. Mm. You know, that was like the perfect sort of model. But actually, you know, however many years it is later, two, three years later, it turns out not to be the case. I mean, Alex is Part of the problem that Gimlet are just making slightly duffer things. Uh, everything, does that mean? everything has an audience. Everything can have an audience. It's just Spotify's is still a music platform. If you want to listen to streaming music, you know, as much as Tidal or even Apple Music mm. wants to be, Spotify is the home of streaming music. If you want to go listen to podcasts, it's either the Google Play Store, I don't know the, the Google Play, or it is the, is the iTunes. Well, sorry, Apple, Apple Podcasts Podcast now. <laughs> yeah. So boomer of me to still say that. Um, so. If it's can they turn the tide and make Spotify the home of music and podcasts in audiences' mind, I think this shows that they haven't managed that yet. It's I mean, that's that's obviously their aim, isn't it? I mean, they, they they want to be that home, but they need to make a little money on advertising. Their subscription revenue basically pays the last quarter's music bills. They need the podcast ad money to keep the thing going. Yeah. So if that's the main driver, then you know the podcast advertising reach needs to keep growing. So that that would seem to be the the right approach. I think the other thing to your point about is almost a user interface issue mm. as well, because by the time you get onto Spotify and you've got your music and you've got your podcast, and I know there's been attempts to kind of you know recommend within the algorithm, etc. But for me, it feels like a bit like what twitter are doing with the kind of for you and following and it's almost like oh i've got too many choices to make within my platform that used to be really simple so i think it's it's keeping the user experience simple is is a huge challenge for these uh, organizations but even now. on the payments thing how are they being paid so if you cory doctor i wrote a really good book mm. around around the music that i'm so and like pay me more spotify that'd be really nice um <laughs> <laughs> and i've got a quarter of a million streams um <laughs> So the big record labels still control that and how the money gets mm. gets sent down, not necessarily by the number of streams you've had, but it, it's really complicated. But it, Taylor Swift will get all of the, so much more money than a smaller streamer out for the same number of streams for a variety of concerts. What is the model here? I don't know the details of this, but how if you're a small 
creator, how can you be incentivized to put it on Spotify Bespoke? And how are you pushing people where the CPMs and RPMs are higher across Apple and the read-ins are more likely to, to be maintained in different apps rather than through Spotify? It's a challenge for them and one that they're keen to try and fix. If you're a Gimlet-style company, maybe you'd hope that you'd be acquired by one of the big boys. Do you think this suggests that that gold rush has, has come to an end? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a podcasting company, if you're an audio company, mm. how we interact with how, whatever happens with the metaverse, how AI plays into this, audio has a huge potential and whoever experiments with this sort of emerging platforms best there is still huge upside and also what the the amount of money there is still to be made in growth within audio is huge i mean that's what your research at Kantar is saying about advertiser intent advertiser intent is there i think ultimately it'll be the media agencies who are looking at audio networks and working out which which ones to buy from which ones not to so having premium brands good content recognizable content that's proving its growth is vital well, the best content obviously attracts acquisition in this show is the media quiz. That's the core piece of IP that one day uh, I'll be on a high numbered TV channel talking about. But before we get there, uh, this is pilot number 421 of the media podcast. <laughs> we'll see if uh, it works. Um, I've got three questions for you this week from the world of telly. All you've got to do is buzz in with your name if you think you know the answer. So Alex will say Alex and Jane will say Jane. Right. Off we go. Question number one. Doctor Who has announced the Doctor's most powerful enemy yet. Who is it? Alex. Yes, Alex. It's the person from RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes, this is... What are they called? Jinx Monsoon. Uh, after winning two seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race, the drag queen's been cast in Doctor Who, and I think photos of them appeared uh, on the internet today. And so Doctor Who's going to return in November this year uh, with uh, the first episode with the brand new 15th Doctor. Jane, do you think this, this reboot's going to work for them? Oh, I don't know. Doctor Who's always reinventing itself. Mm, That's the whole literally. premise, isn't it, of the whole thing? So I guess... I I guess the producers need to try everything and also to continue being relevant for younger audiences. I think the audience is probably younger than we than we suspect. But yeah, I, I don't know. There are people who understand the core of Doctor Who, what's gone on. They know all the details. I'm not one of those. I'm a light viewer and I get confused every time I watch it. But I still quite like it anyway. So Alex, Russell T. Davis is back uh, for, for Doctor Who. When he brought it back the first time, it, it did very well. They've got loads of Disney money that's going to go into it too. Do you think they're going to manage to create a sort of Doctor Who universe? Well, therein lies the point, right? It doesn't matter how well Doctor Who performs in the UK because it is purely for profit. It is BBC's money-making arm across a lot of the Americas and anywhere overseas. So as much as the BBC would like to say, yes, this is vital that the, <laughs> the UK audiences are, are really engaged some of the casting here you can see how america might go a little bit polarized on some of them some of these decisions and it is the it is an interesting and progressive and good choice to do so i'll be interested to see the reaction both within bits of the uk and the us to some of these decisions it's also interesting to look at like what stays the same as mm. well as what keeps mm. changing so i think if you think about it from a kind of marketing point of view they've got very distinctive brand assets which yes. have been going on for decades and they are consistent and they're used in every episode so we've got you know Daleks you've got the TARDIS you've got the music the scarf you know so actually that is the constant thing that I think people rely on and find interesting the the icing on the cake is the changing characters mm. the changing Doctor Who's the new things they introduce but ultimately it's the constant elements the brand assets that i think are interesting and it brings the whole family doesn't it because a uh, mum and dad tune in because they remember it from when they were a kid and yep. bring their kids along okay question number two uh, which blockbuster bust up will be turned into a three-part channel four documentary so it's a bust up that was the source of a trial alex yes that we heard yes i know that it's part of channel four's big old we're going to make controversial programs and see how much we can annoy the right wing, um, which is interesting. You know, they're going to show what they're showing during Prince Charles's uh, Prince Charles's um, inaugura not inauguration. I'm so American. Well, King, King, coronation. King, there we go. King Charles. In, King Charles. In fact, yeah. King Charles. Um, they are making the choice to show the Prince Andrew documentary, and so it's part of that 
push for Channel 4 to go back to its, you know, word, 80s, 90s, big sort of push back into this counterculture. It's still behind ITVX in the way that they're really pushing their digital platform. So if they're going to be this voice of Gen Z and Gen Alpha, ITV is pushing them in that way. So how can Channel 4 go bigger, better, more different, more interesting, and then compete with YouTube and compete with everything else? And I mean, Jane... Too soon? I mean, too soon? Channel 4's kind of 90s position of being uh, spiky, or 80s and 90s position of mm. being kind of the spiky broadcaster. Mm. Uh, it's facing that attack from, from everywhere. And even, as Alex was saying, ITV, which generally didn't get into this space before, it's tough for them. I think I think it is, and branding is really important here. Like ITVX Channel Four, you know, Four on Demand is now called Channel Four. Channel 4. You know, so I think that was an interesting decision mm. to make. But you're right, this sort of you know the whole counterculture thing was invented in an era of no internet, no social media, nobody was able to share anything really. So I think you know media brands do thrive on difference. And if you want to be very different, you've got to constantly reinvent how that works and how you're positioned. But Channel 4 have undergone some interesting changes recently. They're maintaining their status, yes, at least. they're back on safer ground. They're back on safer ground. So I think we'll, you know, for me, branding is really important in media, how you position your different platforms. And I'm just interested that the on-demand service is called Channel 4. I, I, I'm not sure that, stands out for me yes it's gonna be interesting to see they put out a load of pilots like so just just the pilots they put them Mm. out to and it just seemed to be a lot of naked people that was the main (laughs) that was the main bulk of their piloting was just naked people oh they're on an adventure this time they're going to this house and it was (laughs) and naked people are available online in a number of different (laughs) ways i've heard Uh, right question three jane i think you need to try and um win back some honor yeah i I might not though okay here we go question number three which two tv companies have partnered to create an adventure reality show called destination x Uh, destination x and it's a it's a belgian series and it's just the same as everything else um what no in this you're in a coach with blacked out windows they then show a bit of where you are and you have to guess where you are. There's a Channel 4 pilot of like naked alone. And <laughs> it's the same thing. Just with clothes. It's just, yeah. give, just put an escape room on. Just put a live stream <laughs> of everybody going to the escape room and then, or, and then have Danny Dyer present it. And then have a sort of lights off, lights off system. And at the end, someone goes on a date. So much, <laughs> so much of that format. But don't do it streaming live. That's the most important thing. It's, so it's... It feels like where, where is your where is your banker? So now that this this how we've done task how Taskmaster has performed in these all of these multiple locations really interesting format. Doesn't people are looking and sort of scrambling around to try and do this thing, and it's just it's the same. I mean, Jane, forty nine percent share. I mean, we don't know loads about Belgian TV. That would suggest maybe it's got more of a chance than Alex's. It sounds quite high, doesn't it? um, uh, We don't know enough about Belgian TV to know whether that's true, but it sounds quite high. And it also sounds like on that premise, you know, let's not forget this is commercial as well. Mm. It should be quite attractive to a sponsor or to advertisers who want to advertise in it. But nothing's truly new, is it, (laughs) ever in broadcasting? (laughs) There's a bit of reinvention and sort of creativity on the top. To get on on my high horse, really (laughs) high horse. So there's there's a brilliant sort of, I forget her name, but there's an internet sort of expert around the future of the internet. And we're sort of saying that the influencer economy is dead and we're now entering the the age of the creator economy. Mm. So the idea of just being a sort of vision of, of what you think is attractive or enviable which this show seems to play into is audiences have moved on and now it's about how interesting is this person what are they creating what stuff are they doing what what can i learn from this am i informed educated entertained mm. you know back to the mm. bbc core principles and so if audiences are moving on and i think that was a, it's a really interesting argument that I, I agree with then this feels like it is a couple of years behind but do some people just want to sit back and watch people get off a bus going, I think this is Paris. <laughs> we, will, we will see. And, and I will watch it on Gogglebox. That, that's how <laughs> I consume this sort of content. Is what, is Gogglebox is the perfect hour of the, that sort of content. That is just like, oh, I will agree with this person and this person. So Des- Destination X is coming to the BBC and to NBC Universal, to I guess Peacock and some of their platforms. Congratulations to Alex. Uh, you won that quiz. What you win is the chance to lead all of Channel 4's uh, naked-related programming. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, for yeah. the next for the next 12 months 
well done. And thank you both uh, for joining us today. Uh, where are you off to next? Because now we're recording the evenings. People have exciting evening plans. W- what are you off to do? Well, I'm going home to let my dog out for a wee. Nice. And important. then I'm going to my partner's house and we're going to hopefully have some dinner. Hopefully he's cooking me something. Excellent. On And watch one of the subscription services. Of course. Uh, and Alex? <laughs> I'm going to go to Battersea Art Centre and see Hate Radio, which is a show about the construction of radio. I know so little about it because oh. my partner knows so much more about theatre than I do, which makes me a terrible person. But I'm sure it, it has high expectations, good reviews, so we are excited. Well, it sounds quite media You'll have to send us a review. And how can people follow what you're both up to, Jane? I think the easiest way is to go to Kantar.com and look at the inspiration <laughs> articles on there because that's where all the thought leadership is. The other way for people to get hold of us is also to look at Kantar on LinkedIn, subscribe to... Uh, monthly roundup of everything that goes on there. Lovely. Mm. Alex? Uh, so either search for Newsweek Infinite Scroll, which is my weekly column newsletter, or on Instagram, because Twitter is dead, at, <laughs> uh, at Alex Hudds, <laughs> A-L-E-X-H-U-D-S. And people can, of course, stream your music on Spotify as oh, well. To, to wow, up, yes. To up, to up that, that If you those, search for cash. No Alexander, the EP is has been out for too long. The debut album is being recorded in the next few weeks. So then that is coming out. Uh, it's being drip released uh, from <laughs> I'm too old uh, from September. Thank yeah. you both.